We're going to be moving the session now to uh, a bit more different perspectives. Uh, I'm Mike Osterholm, I'm a professor here in School of Public Health at the university. And I just want to say uh, uh, also a welcome as a, one of the pl program planning committee members to not only to you here in the audience, but to actually our audience in Europe. Good afternoon to you. We have people on the webcast there. And I want to start out by actually offering a personal perspective as I stand here today to moderate this, because I don't stand here with great expertise in human participants and studies other than I've been a both a, on both sides of those. But I actually stand here today as someone who realizes that between now and the time I take my last breath, I may very well be a candidate as a participant in a study of great importance of which I am going to have for all the reasons already outlined this morning, potentially some issues about how I consent or don't consent to that study. But more importantly, I'm like many of you in this room. I have family members or fam friends who are by every definition mentally ill, who are incapacitated from a standpoint of making cognitive decisions that we would all agree are made with full informed consent because of whatever status they might have. I have family members who have severe chemical abuse problems who at times may very well be able to make good decisions and can't. And so it's very hard for any of us up here just to stand here as academicians because in a sense this is all really about all of us, about all the time. And so today what we wanted to do as a part of the program planning committee is actually schedule a session here which is entitled Multiple Perspectives on the National Debates and Consent Challenges, knowing that there is not a right answer but we sure can learn a lot. And today we're very fortunate to have four di uh, different experts with us, all who will provide a perspective. Uh, and I'll introduce each one of them at the time that they will come up. They will give a 10 minute presentation. Uh, they've all agreed to keep it to 10 minutes out of courtesy for their fellow speakers and so that we can also open it up then for a dialogue with this audience, which we realize is very important. Um, and as at the time then that they're done, we will ask them to come all up to sit up here as well as our two morning speakers. And then it's open uh, for all questions and coming. So our first speaker today uh, is Sue Abderholden, who is the executive director of the National Alliance on Mental Health Minnesota. Sue has devoted her career to changing laws and attitudes that affect people with disabilities and their families. At the National Alliance on Mental Illness Minnesota, she is focused on the stigma surrounding mental illness and the broken system of care for children and adults with mental illnesses. Over the past 25 years, Sue has successfully fought for community and family support and for the laws that enable people with disabilities to fully participate in society. She has a very uh, important and supportive background in that she held positions with the ARC Minnesota. She understands policy as having served on U.S. Senator Paul Wellstone's staff and also at the Pacer Center. We're very honored to have her with us today. And Sue, the floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. All right, so I'm going to talk fast. <laughs> Um, first, I just want to make sure everyone knows, so mental illness affects one in five people in every given year, and it affects everyone, children and adults, men and women, people from every race, ethnicity, religion, and political parties, Democrats and Republicans alike, and it affects people from every profession, football players, physicians, teachers, artists, musicians, meteorologists. The symptoms disrupt a person's thinking, feeling, mood, ability to relate to others, and daily functioning. So you can understand how these symptoms could interfere with decision making. But mental illnesses are on a continuum, and not every person with a mental illness becomes disabled by their illness or has their capacity to consent compromised. We prefer to focus on people's strengths using words like courage and determination, not weakness or incompetency. Treatment effectiveness ranges anywhere between 60 to 80 percent, and we know that early identification and treatment can lead to recovery and prevent them from becoming disabling. I do want to note that treatment involves much more than medication and includes therapy, diet and exercise, complementary therapies, such as mindfulness training, social connection to friends and families, and having a reason to get up in the morning, such as having a job, attending school, or volunteering. Unfortunately, in our mental health system here and frankly across the country, we don't use a public health approach to treating people with mental illnesses. 
First, we don't identify people early. They live with their symptoms an average of 10 years before seeking treatment, 72 weeks for a young person experiencing their first psychotic symptoms. Second, intensive treatment isn't provided until someone has been hospitalized or committed numerous times. Assertive community treatment and evidence-based practice isn't made available until someone has become disabled due to their illness and has a history of homelessness or hospitalizations. It's akin to waiting uh, to treat people with cancer until they hit stage four. When we discuss involving people with serious mental illnesses in research, we need to keep in mind the continuum and that people are frankly much sicker when they come into our public mental health system and by the time people are before the courts, they're extremely ill. In Minnesota, every year, about 4,300 people are committed to treatment for their mental illness. Now, the commitment law is about involuntary treatment, not competency. Guardianship is about competency. And this is a very important difference. In order to be committed to treatment, at least in Minnesota, an individual must have a diagnosis of a mental illness, and there must be a strong likelihood that the individual will harm themselves or others, as evidenced by failure to obtain food, clothing, shelter, or Medicare, medical care as a result of their illness, or inability to obtain these things, and it's more probable than not that the person will suffer harm, serious illness, or significant psychiatric deterioration as a result of not receiving that medical care, or there's a recent attempt or threat to physically harm themselves or others, or there's recent conduct involving significant damage to substantial property, and there is no less restrictive way for the person to get treatment. So it's important to remember that people are committed to treatment for a variety of symptoms, including psychosis, but also due to serious depression and thoughts of suicide. Most people in Minnesota are committed for up to six months. And again, commitment is for mental health treatment, not competency, and it's not guardianship. As a matter of fact, few people with serious mental illnesses, including people with schizophrenia, are under guardianship because of one word, recovery. Judges are very reluctant to take away people's rights to make the decisions about their lives when it's often a temporary situation. Many people begin to feel better in a couple of days or weeks once they get treatment. And many people whose symptoms decrease and are moving towards recovery are placed on a stay of commitment, meaning if they continue to follow their treatment plan, their commitment will be discharged. The commitment law doesn't really talk about competency, except to say that an individual can consent to other types of treatment if the physician believes the person's competent. While under commitment, there is nothing in law that prevents the individual from signing contracts, using their credit card, taking out loans, and more, and there's nothing that prohibit companies or entities from making them accountable for their actions. So you need to keep this in mind as we turn to discussing allowing people with mental illnesses to participate in research. Even in 2015, our understanding of the brain is limited, and research is really in the beginning stages. Technology has helped in terms of stronger MRIs, but even then, we're viewing the brain at the 30,000-foot level. Without a better understanding of the brain and increased funding for research, new treatments for mental illnesses are limited. But people with mental illnesses and their families hold out hope that new research will emerge and lead to better outcomes, which will allow our society and communities to benefit from their gifts and talents. We need research of the brain and research to find better mental health treatment, not just medications, but different forms of therapy and technology. Tom Insel, who just stepped down as the head of NAIMH, wrote that, quote, we need to be humble. The science of mental illness is still in its infancy, and our treatments, while helping many to get better, do not help enough to get well. So you have people who have not gotten better, some who have gotten better but not well, but all of whom desire recovery. It could be that the side effects of medication are just too difficult, but at the same time, the symptoms interfere with their recovery. They want to find a better treatment so that they can get better and lead full lives. There are also people who believe in the greater good, if you will. I'm reminded of the quote that we are here to plant the seeds of trees under whose shade we will not sit. They want it to be better for the next generation. We know this is true for people with cancer, whose only hope is a new treatment, and they know it really may not help them, but will increase understanding and treatment of that particular cancer in the future. It is no different for people with mental illnesses. Despite having two very good reasons to participate in research, there is still hesitancy. 
We want to make sure that although someone with a mental illness hasn't been deemed incompetent by a court, that they're protected nonetheless. Initially, when first hospitalized or under a commitment, a person's ability to consent may be compromised. And of course, it could be compromised any time that they're symptomatic. And while we shouldn't unilaterally prohibit people with mental illness from participating in research at this time, we should use the tools that exist to determine if they're competent to make decisions. There's a couple of tools, the UBACC, the MacArthur Competency Assessment Tool for Clinical Research. A very small percentage of people stay committed for, excuse me, for a very long time due to lack of insight, and they stop treatment once the commitment is lifted, and then they quickly deteriorate. But is it fair to deny the people with the most serious mental illnesses new treatment that might work better and could help them achieve recovery? And while they may not have insight, they may want to change their outcomes. Few people with mental illnesses are under guardianship, so there aren't alternative decision makers or legally authorized representatives. Even worse, our mental health system has systematically excluded family members from being involved in a loved one's care or even being able to obtain basic information. And they often use HIPAA as a shield, even though, as NAMI likes to say, HIPAA doesn't require you to be stupid. <laughs> this leaves many people with mental illnesses even more vulnerable in participating in research because often family members aren't allowed to be involved. So there's no advocate, if you will, in the discussions around consent. So we need to either include families or make sure a person has an advocate in the process of agreeing to participate in research. And I also want to just mention that prior to the ACA, especially Medicaid expansion, participating in research for many was the only way to access treatment. Another issue is that the method of asking for consent is not necessarily effective. Simply handling someone a form to read and sign isn't the best way to ensure that someone understands what they're signing and understands the benefits and risks. More should be done to ensure that someone with a mental illness has the information and understanding of the information to actually make a decision. Just as there is a movement in discharge planning to use the teach back method, so there should be here. Studies suggesting adding multimedia tools also improve understanding. So I'm nearing the end of my time, but I want to urge people not to paint people with mental illnesses with one brush. There are many who can consent to participate in research and who are doing it for all the right reasons. Let's just take extra care that they understand what it means to participate in a particular research study, especially the risks and benefits, that they have a family member or advocate with them, and that we have determined outside of a courtroom that they are competent at that moment to consent. But finally, let's not deny people with mental illness and their families the hope for recovery that can come through research. Thank you. Thank you, Sue, for that uh, very good start to the multiple perspectives. Uh, next, we're uh, going to hear from someone who's already asked a question uh, this morning and someone who uh, has been referred to on multiple occasions because of her well-recognized international expertise. Barbara Beer is the professor at Harvard Medical School, senior vice president of research at Brigham's and Women's Hospital, director of the Regulatory Foundation's Ethics and Law at Harvard Catalyst, and a former chair of the Secretary's Advisory Committee on Human Research Protections, Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, Barbara is also co-chair of the Partners Healthcare Committee on Conflict of Interest. In addition to her academic responsibilities, she uh, also was elected to the Board of Directors of the Association for Accreditation of Human Research Protection Programs, serving as its president from 2003 to 2007. She's currently a member of the uh, AAMC AAU Advisory Committee on Financial Conflicts of Interest in Clinical Research and a member of the National Academies of Science Committee on Science, Technology, and the Law. It's really an honor to have you here with us today, and I'll turn it over to Barbara. Thank you. And I want to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. And we'll be up in a minute, hopefully. Yes. Under consent panel. No, the other one. Consent panel, you're right. There we go. That's it. Yep. Good. So um, I thought today I'd take a bit of a step back and talk about general 
consents, not consents uh, specifically for um, for vulnerable participants. But I will say that I have no financial conflicts of interest while we're waiting. I have uh, lots of uh, employment and other opportunities that inform my uh, opinions. Uh, and having just come from the NAS yesterday, all of those are, quote, relevant. Um, <clears throat> and I am very opinionated. And therefore, um, I gave you, we although go. we cannot see it, now you can. Um, my uh, conflicts. So um, I'm going to pick up where Jeff uh, left off a little bit, um, which is to say that informed consent is very, very hard to achieve. And we have never really done a very good job of it. And I think we need to think through where we are with informed consent. And it's a significant problem uh, way beyond that of vulnerable populations. And if we're doing a terrible job on, quote, normal people, we're doing a disastrous job on vulnerable uh, individuals. There are no standard processes by which elements are presented and described. And the documentation of comprehension uh, at the time of consent or thereafter is not required. And it's rarely obtained. Um, and there are very few validated methods for comprehension and even fewer for long-term comprehension. We may ask somebody a week later what they remember, but we don't ask somebody six months into a trial what they remember. Um, there is teach back. It's very poorly uh, implemented. It is successful when done right, uh, but there's very little effort uh, in, in this. The NPRM, which we heard about this morning, has the goal, which is laudable, quote, to facilitate prospective subjects' decision about whether or not to participate in a research study, thereby enhancing autonomy, um, <clears throat> i.e., that the subjects are appropriately informed. And they suggest three primary changes, which I'm summarizing, uh, stricter new requirements require, re regarding required information to prospective subjects. Organize the document to provide sufficient detail, but also facilitate understanding. And present core information first, including only the required elements of consent, and including all other uh, information in the appendices. And that's the approach. Here are the required information of the consent elements. These have been uh, traditionally required. Everybody here is probably familiar with them. Uh, even uh, this, um, to, to this list, which I won't read, the NPRM adds a statement about whether or not the subject's data will be used for future research studies if the identifiers are removed. Um, there are additional consent elements that one must use uh, in certain situations, and to that the NPRM adds three more additional elements. Well, I would venture to say that the basic elements of informed consent are largely unchanged with one new element, and the three additional elements is not going to improve the informed consent process that we are currently engaged in. We are not going to get to a state of better information and better content appreciation by simply adding to the list of elements. So the changes to the informed consent document, um, they require now that only required language that speaks to the elements of consent be in the document, other elements in appendices, and that the final consent forms will be posted on a federal website somewhat after. Again, I would argue that the organization of the document with the core information first and then followed by the appendices later posting is not going to answer our issues. So what are, what are we going to do? The NPRM is not going to fix it. So I would argue for a few different approaches to be tested. First of all, explore research contexts that may not require individual informed consent, but rather public education coupled with governance to ensure that that education is disseminated and efficacious. You could have a risk-based, minimal risk research, um, and potential potentially to opt out. I'm not going to talk about 
as we say, issues with tissues. I'm not going to talk about biospecimen research, but this is one where one might think about it. We emphasize and prioritize public health as a core component of the Belmont principles, currently thoughtfully embedded in justice, but not brought out as a real principle. And then I should say that other public education campaigns have been effective, even if people are um, somewhat cynical about that. Different approach, however, for higher risk research that requires informed consent, interventional studies, blinded control studies, et cetera. Um, and I think that there one really needs to reinvest time in a one-on-one -on -one appreciation of the informed consent process. It's the only thing that really makes a difference. And to reframe the focus, as Jeff said earlier, on investigator responsibilities and integrity. And here I list the SACARP comments that we worked on together. And then commit to plain language summaries, health and numeracy principles in all communication with participants. Here are the CDC clear communication principles. They're not so difficult. Um, and, uh, but we don't do this in general. We don't do this with each other and we don't take care to, uh, to uh, uh, ensure that our communications are plain language. And again, to endorse numeracy principles rather than uh, not. Um, there are alternative uh, approaches. I think that we should think about investing in preparation of the community so that they know what they're uh, looking at, what they're working on, and what they're about to uh, um, uh, consent to. We've developed a whole set of uh, information uh, in order to help people prepare for that conversation with an investigator. Um, and it's available in 15 languages. You can download them. Um, and those are flat brochures. They're plain language, they're appropriate, but they're flat. You can also have uh, web-based uh, um, sort of preparative uh, materials. This is uh, one for individuals preparing for research and to the research participant. And, um, and Children's Hospital Boston took the initiative to do a um, Sophie's uh, Science Project, which is a comic book explaining participation in clinical research. There are lots of things we're not doing now and not thinking about creatively. Um, and we don't really provide that flexibility to explore uh, uh, consent materials. And then there's the use of multimedia tools for IC processes. I went for informed consent processes um, online uh, in one second. You can get 124,000 YouTube videos on MRIs. Imagine if we were to take some of that information, cut it down to 35, 40 seconds, so that people had a visual image of what they would enter when they have a, uh, are undergoing an MRI um, and what the risks and benefits uh, would be. That we could do sort of with a, like a Harry Potter uh, newspaper so that you get to MRI and then you click on it and it comes up so that you understand where you're going uh, with it. Um, these kinds of things we are not uh, exploring and that is where I'd like to look at as a research uh, agenda going forward to think about public education coupled with governance and perhaps an opt out higher risk research, uh, embedding investigator responsibilities, plain language communication, investing in preparation, flexibility to explore uh, consent materials, and interactive multimedia IC informed consent platforms. Um, once you get there, then you're immediately begging the question of e-consents, electronic consents, and when can you use those? Um, it's another uh, 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 effort that we should think about. Um, and uh, these are ideas, uh, but in order to really know when they work, how they work, when we would want them to be employed, we really need to collect the data. And in order to do that, we need the right methodologies to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, now moving on to one of our own uh, here from the University of Minnesota, uh, adding another perspective to this is Carl Elliott, who's professor of the Center for Bioethics, uh, in the, uh, professor in the Center for Bioethics in the Department of Pediatrics and an affiliate faculty member in the Department of Philosophy and School of Journalism and Mass Communications at the U of M. 
Uh, Carl is the author or editor of seven books, including White Coat, Black Hat, Adventures in the Dark Side of Medicine, published in 2010, and Better Than Well, American Medicine Meets the American Dream in 2003. His articles have appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic Monthly, The London Review of Books, Mother Jones, The New York Times, and The New England Journal of Medicine. In 2011, the Austin Riggs Center awarded him its Erickson Prize for Excellence in Mental Health Media. He is a fellow of the Hastings Center, a former network fellow at the Safra Center for Ethics at Harvard University, and a member of the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Carl, very happy to have you. Thank you all for coming, and thanks for inviting me. I appreciate the invitation. So um, this term I've been teaching a new course uh, over in the Honors College, an Honors Seminar, and it's on um, medical research scandals. So for three months, it's been all scandals all the time. It's the All Scandal Channel. Uh, two scandals a week for an entire uh, semester. And we've sort of started with the, the classics, Tuskegee, Willowbrook, Holmesburg, uh, the unfortunate experiment in uh, Auckland, New Zealand, and going right up to the present day. And it's really been the first time I've had a chance to read about so many different research scandals back to back. And I thought maybe I'd start today with some sort of um, unsystematic uh, observations about um, what I've learned from that course. So uh, first observation, um, whistleblowers are very rare, even in the most dangerous institutions. I mean, this actually surprised me, but it's true. And it's true whether you're talking about a, a drug company or a CRO or a government agency or a university. Dissent is rare. Uh, when there is dissent, the dissenters usually keep it in-house, and they almost never uh, blow the whistle to the press. So that's first observation. Second, um, when someone does blow the whistle, usually nobody listens. Um, often it takes years to get any kind of action. I mean, looking back, as shocking as the Tuskegee syphilis study seems now, it took Peter Buxton six years to get a reporter actually interested in um, reporting that story. And with the cancer trial scandals um, in the 80s and 90s at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, it took John Passando, the whistleblower there, nearly 20 years, which leads to the third thing. When scandals do happen, uh, the wrongdoers are rarely punished. In fact, they're often rewarded. You can see this particularly when you look back at the, you know, the scandals of the 60s and 70s. So, for example, uh, Saul Krugman, who you might remember, uh, fed hepatitis A to mentally retarded children at the Willowbrook State School, um, later became president of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Uh, John Cutler, who um, was one of the architects both of Tuskegee and of the Guatemala syphilis studies, later became professor and dean at the University of Pittsburgh. And Chester Southam, who injected live cancer cells into elderly patients at the Jewish Chronic Disease Hospital, became president of the American Association for Cancer Research. Now, those are old cases, but even today, uh, most, most researchers who are accused of wrongdoing uh, land on their feet. And fourth thing, uh, institutional officials almost never do the right thing. I mean, in fact, I don't think all term we found a single case where a medical school dean has been told of wrongdoing and responded in a decent and honorable way. Instead, the reaction is almost always defensive. Uh, cover it up, keep it quiet, and above all, don't tell the patients. Now, uh, we've had our share of scandals here at the U, of course. the most uh, notable of which um, have occurred in our Department of Psychiatry, where a young man named Dan Markinson tried to decapitate himself after being coerced into an industry-funded antipsychotic study. I'm assuming this audience knows about the Markinson case. 
Um, last spring, uh, two reviews, one of that case in particular, found evidence of coercion, uh, profound conflicts of interest, uh, a superficial, porous system of research oversight, and a climate of fear and intimidation in the Department of Psychiatry that made staff members afraid to speak up on behalf of patients. Now, if you look at our scandals, in a lot of ways, they fit that historical pattern. It took 11 years for Dan Markinson's mother to get any kind of vindication. That fits the pattern. Nobody at the University of Minnesota has been sanctioned or punished in any way for the wrongdoing. Again, that fits the pattern. University officials, including the president, misled the public with deceptive statements for years before they were finally exposed. Again, that fits the pattern. Now, where the University of Minnesota stands out, I think, is how consistent its response has been over such a long period of time. It doesn't matter who was speaking. It could be the president, it could be the board of regents, it could be the dean, it could be the general counsel, it could be the communications office, no matter who it was, the answer was always the same. And that answer was, we did nothing wrong, we have been exonerated, and we're not answering your questions. So it was that, but it wasn't just that. The university has been remarkably aggressive towards its critics. And I, I don't just mean the fact that the university filed a legal action against Dan Markinson's mother, demanding that she pay the University of Minnesota $57,000, although that's pretty aggressive. I've never come across this term anyway. Another university that was willing to file a legal action against a dead research subject's family. What I'm talking about here at the U is the strategy of defending yourself by trying to uh, discredit and smear your critics. Now, as you can see, a lot of that has been directed at me, of course. Um, and that message has been consistent no matter who it's come from, from the PR office up to the dean. That message is, uh, I was lying, I was distorting the facts, I was on a crusade against the university, I was just trying to sell my books. Apparently, the notion that anyone at the University of Minnesota might actually be trying to protect research subjects was so bizarre and unfamiliar that it never even entered their minds. Now, as I said, a lot of that was against me, but it wasn't all me. For example, when uh, Nikki Jerry, a psychiatric nurse at Fairview, and by the way, a member of our IRB at the university for over 17 years, when Nikki Jerry spoke to a reporter last year about the Markinson case, the university's PR office went on the attack against her as well, saying that she had no credibility to speak about the case. Now, Nikki knows how to defend herself, so do I. I'm a tenured professor here. I have some protection. But patients don't have that kind of protection. Some of you may know of the ongoing controversy re regarding a uh, patient named Robert Huber. Robert was coerced into testing an unapproved antipsychotic uh, while he was confined to a locked unit at Fairview under a 72-hour emergency hold. And years later, when he um, finally worked up the courage to speak to a reporter about his case, the university communications office accessed his medical records and then used his private medical history um, in an effort to try and discredit him. And uh, since that kind of action has been since sanctioned and endorsed by the dean, uh, I can assume that we'll be seeing more of that in the future. Now, today, since those two external reviews, of course, the PR strategy has changed. It says we're reforming our policies, we're looking forward. This conference, for example, is proof of our good faith. But the fact is, the problem here at the U has never been our policies. It's been our people. That's why, when the legislative auditor reviewed the Markinson case, he singled out the actions of the university leaders as the single most troubling aspect of the scandal. And of course, that's never been on the agenda. From the very beginning of this controversy, up until today, the university has sent out a single, consistent, 
but unspoken message. Here's what that unspoken message says. If you break the rules, we'll look the other way. If you harm a research subject, we'll cover it up. If somebody speaks out, we will do our best to harass and discredit them and make them regret it. And until that message is admitted and disavowed, and the people responsible for it have been sanctioned, I can't see anything at this university changing. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. I'm sure we will have uh, quite a bit of additional discussion here relating to that. Our last speaker is Richard Sharp. Uh, Richard is uh, the professor and director of the Biomedical Ethics Program, the Center for Individualized Medicine Bioethics Program, and the Clinical and Translational Research Ethics Program at the Mayo Clinic. He has studied a variety of topics in biomedical ethics, including the integration of genetic technologies into patient care, best practices for clinical ethics consultation, financial conflicts of interest, and ethical dimensions of patient advocacy. Richard frequently advises healthcare organizations on ethical issues and has served on advisory committees for the National Institutes of Health, the Institute of Medicine, and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Thank you. We're very glad to have you here today. Thanks. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. It appears I've drawn the short straw with regard to the ordering of the talks, but indeed uh, want to, uh, to talk you through some issues that our group has been thinking about for some time. And also want to say um, I'm going to be talking about uh, some complex issues that have to do with responding to research scandals and be very clear that my comments are not directed specifically at the case that we just heard Dr. Elliott re uh, review. Uh, that's not a case that I have that kind of acquaintance with or familiarity with, and so I'm not directing any comments specifically to that case. I want to raise a, a slightly larger, more abstract question here. And that question is, when a research scandal does occur and people come forward from the community and from the public and say, why is it that we should trust that your university and the researchers that are at your university are people of integrity, that they are individuals that are acting in the right sorts of ways. They're doing the right things by way of their patients and their research volunteers. When we seek to answer that question, how, how good are the answers that we provide? Now, we heard from our speakers this morning that we have a system that the, was referred to as one that has been extraordinarily successful in providing protections to research volunteers. But when something goes wrong and questions get called, how good are our answers? And I think what we heard in the talks this morning were that those answers cluster around a couple of main points. The first is that we have a committee, right? We have a committee that is staffed by university employees and researchers that reviews every protocol, includes one member of the community, as a matter of fact, in addition to that. And those individuals have signed off on the ethically appropriate nature of the study being conducted. That's part of the answer. The other part of the answer is that we ask people whether they want to participate in these studies, for the most part. But we, as we heard, by and large, many people make decisions about participation that are inherently uninformed. Again, not a particularly compelling answer. So if we, if we are called out on that question, why should we trust that the research supported by your university is in fact ethical and done by people of integrity? If our answer to that is we have a committee and we ask people, how compelling is that answer? And I want to suggest that that's not very compelling at all. And honestly, if you do find that answer compelling, I, I would suspect that means you were brought up in a good neighborhood, quite honestly. Uh, and I don't mean that in a facetious or, or joking way. Uh, I think that that really is a reflection of the kind of assumptions that we bring to medical institutions more generally. If that's sufficient as an answer to you, it means that you probably have a very good relationship with medical institutions. So we started to ask this question. We said, what, what can we learn from other areas of society that deal with similar types of questions? And our team asked this question, what might we learn from non-medical sectors in which there are occasionally crises of public confidence that can engender more systematic uh, assaults on, the, uh, on those institutions? So we went, to exa for example, to individuals that are in the food industry and ask them how they respond to national crises associated with E. coli threats. 
uh, when Chipotle, for example, uh, recently had its scare around E. coli. Uh, as it turned out, uh, some people stopped going to restaurants for a small amount of time, but there was no national crisis that was a result of that. It wasn't as though all of us stopped eating fast food uh, for months on end. When an aircraft uh, crashes and it goes down, uh, people respond to that in ways that I think are very different from the ways in which healthcare institutions respond to their crises when they occur. When a person dies in a clinical trial, that response looks very different from the response of the airline industry to when a flight goes down. And so we decided that we would convene a group of leaders in these non-medical uh, industries, ask them to come together and help to advise us in terms of ways in which the healthcare industry might do a better job of responding to uh, crises of public confidence. And what we learned from them was that uh, the things that they find to be most successful are things that healthcare institutions in general don't do a very good job with. So they told us, for example, that it's critical that the public understands your mission and understands in their terms what it is that you're trying to accomplish. They said it's key that there be transparency about the potential benefits and risks of the, th of the things that you do. Right? The dangers of food contamination need to be evident to the public and in a way that perhaps is very different from the ways in which the dangers of participation in medical research are currently evident to the public. That there needs to be shared vocabularies and a habit of listening to your constituents to understand what their needs and concerns may be. And then in addition, if you rely solely upon government regulators to ensure that the work that you're doing embodies the highest of ethical standards, that you're falling far short of what the benchmark should be. That self-regulation uh, needs to be in place in, as well. As one of our uh, representatives from the airline industry, I remember very poignantly said, they said, if we rely on the government to regulate the airline industry, the planes will be dropping out of the sky every day. <laughs> I just remember that so, so vividly because, frankly, it's scary to think about, but it, it actually is uh, very important and so relevant to the conversation we're having this morning. Compliance alone doesn't get us very far. It's the integrity of those individuals that are charged with ensuring that human subjects are fully protected. That's absolutely critical. And the last point that we learned from them was that uh, the system of oversight that you have has to be blame-free and non-hierarchical. If a, a person who is a grounds crewman has a concern about the safety of the airplane, that individual can shut down the entire flight. We, we know that. Right? But we don't stop to think about what's the significance of that power that we vest in that individual who is sort of at the lowest level of the totem pole with regard to the operation of, an, of the airline industry. That it's not only the case that individual, that individual can stop the flight, everybody involved wants that person to step forward. And there's a system in place that allows them to step forward without fear of retribution. Again, the contrast here between this, this type of messaging that we heard and what I think is commonplace in, medical, in, in many medical institutions is really quite striking. They talked to us as well about the importance of differentiating between the kind of trust that's critical in, in moments of crisis and the kind of trust that you hope to establish more generally. Um, in particular, they talked about the importance of root cause analysis when some sort of crisis engendering event does occur that there be an effort to systematically evaluate what went wrong and that there be transparency and involvement from people that sit outside of that particular institution in the process. A commitment essentially being evidence that you want to ensure that this type of tragedy never occurs again. And again, I think these are things that make a lot of sense. I think there's a lot of common sense embodied in this, these sorts of statements. But the contrast here was what really stood out to us, the contrast between a typical response to a crisis in the context of the conduct of medical research and these types of, of crises that occur in non-medical industries. And then lastly, as a result of the interactions that we had with these non-medical experts, we began to think about some conceptual frames of reference that might help to guide healthcare institutions in promoting and, and establishing trust in times of crisis. And here we were inspired by some of the literature that's come out of Europe that focuses on what's, what's commonly referred to as promotion of a culture of safety. 
And here you have several different stages with regard to what you might think of as the evolution of an emergence of a culture of safety. And I think this kind of conceptual frame of reference really applies very nicely to trying to establish a, a culture of integrity and ethical conduct in human subjects research as well. Now most, most universities aren't going to be sitting at the bottom end of this particular spectrum. Uh, I don't think that many of us would look around at our uh, universities and say that nobody cares about the protection of human research subjects. But I suspect that many of us probably have institutions that fit more in the second and third of these categories, where our efforts to improve upon uh, patient safety are largely reactive to problems that we identify at some point along the way. Uh, that we don't necessarily take a more proactive stance with regard to ensuring uh, subject safety. And that we rely extensively on the third of these uh, boxes. We rely upon the system, the system of compliance that we have in place and equate compliance with integrity in ways that I think may limit our ability to be more imaginative with regard to instilling public confidence in medical research. And so these folks suggested to us that we think about ways in which we might become more proactive and more generative so that ultimately we can become uh, committed to the idea that promotion of subject welfare is simply a part of the way in which research is always done. That everybody's thinking about that all the time. Not just when something goes wrong, not just because the IRB asked them to think about those matters, but it's just part of the way in which business is done at research universities. And here, I, I want to close by asking you to think a little bit about the contrast between this farthest end of the spectrum, this end of the spectrum in which we might uh, suggest that this really embodies the, a full commitment to uh, research integrity, and the current ways in which people think about uh, institutional review boards and their roles. Uh, at many institutions, there's enormous resentment of IRBs. IRB, IRBs are viewed as barriers to the conduct of human subjects research, as slowing down much needed medical research, as staffed largely by micromanaging research administrators that are more concerned with institutional liability than the promotion of valuable research. Uh, maybe it's different here, but I, I hear that elsewhere. And think about the contrast that we have to overcome here if we are in fact to get to this more generative matter. I think it involves uh, increasing levels of transparency with the community and ultimately involves giving over some degree of power and control over the research agenda to community representatives as well in a way that I think that few institutions are really committed to doing. So I would encourage you know, the folks that are here at the University of Minnesota to think about what's happened recently as an opportunity to engender genuine, formative, substantive changes here with, with regard to your systems. It isn't very often that an opportunity like this comes along, and I'd encourage you to take advantage of it. Thank you. If we could ask our speakers this morning to come on up. Now is the unique opportunity to have audience participation with a, a really a true variety of expertises and perspectives. So with that, we have the microphones in the audience. If you could raise your hand while we're uh, assembling the panel, and then we'll get the microphone to you. Any questions here? I'll take that off. If not, I'm going to start asking. Here's, okay, here we have over here. Uh, over in this corner here, I'm sorry, I'm trying to look and see. Raise your hand high. We don't want to miss you. Robert. Thank you. Please uh, identify yourself, too. Thanks. Sure. Robert Steinberg, General Internal Medicine. I guess uh, this question is mostly for uh, Dr. Elliott and Dr. Sharp but the rest of the panel. What is it, and I'm not speaking specifically about the situation here, which I don't know all that much about, but what do you see as the reasons why healthcare institutions uh, perhaps have had different responses than other institutions in society? Is it something about healthcare? Is it something about medicine? Is it something about academia? Is it something else? I can. Is this on? Yep, you're on. Uh, yeah, I can take a couple of guesses. You know, I, I don't have a, um, I don't have a huge amount of knowledge. 
One of the things that I was thinking about when I was listening to uh, Richard's case uh, compared to the airline industry is that um, healthcare institutions are largely closed. When a plane goes down, you can't hide it. It's very easy to hide things uh, in hospitals and medical schools. Secondly, the entire um, basis of research oversight in universities is essentially based on trust. You don't have a lot of monitoring of research going on. And so when you have an IRB, which is, uh, which is responsible for oversight, and they're not skeptical at all about what they're hearing from investigators and simply take it as true, um, then that's a system that's very easy to gain. I, w I would agree for with sure. that, and I think partly it, it also... Could you speak... Yeah, uh, maybe you're... I'm sorry. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, I would agree with many of those comments, and I think in addition there, there are uh, strong disincentives to uh, increasing transparency in this space to, to build on uh, Carl's points there. Um, we all hear about the mantra of publish or perish, no margin, no mission, all these sorts of things that are part of the rhetoric of uh, modern academic health centers. You know, being more transparent, engaging with members of the community proactively in spaces like this costs time, it costs money, slows research down, and I think that with regard to all the different financial systems and structures that are in place, uh, there's enormous disincentives to increasing transparency uh, in, in these kinds of ways. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from the panel members that would like to address this issue? Any thoughts? Yes, Jeff. Yeah, I guess uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would uh, have to say so much of this is sort of case specific that I'd want to unpack the comments from both of the last two uh, speakers, uh, Carl and Rich, about exactly what sorts of events are we talking about. In terms of the systematic uh, improvement of systems within IRBs and oversights, you know, I do see that as a continuous quality improvement sort of uh, enterprise, uh, AHARP being a significant element of how institutions try to maintain standards. Uh, one element we haven't talked at all about is data safety monitoring boards that monitor the progress of research and can pick up on uh, unanticipated events, potentially stop the uh, research, uh, et cetera. So there are these other elements that are part of the research enterprise that can respond when you have adverse events that are uh, not anticipated but anticipated to a certain extent. Some of the cases that we're thinking about here have to do with uh, egregious uh, uh, behavior of a particular investigator. And I very much agree that that's a harder set of case cases to address. I'm not sure, uh, I'd be interested in uh, hearing more about uh, Carl's uh, examples, um, but it's hard to draw out. Uh, I think we do need a set of uh, principles and a set of institutional mechanisms to deal with that type of problem, which I see is different than the type of problem that arises when you have a serious adverse event and a uh, research protocol that I do think our systems are reasonably well structured to identify. Yeah. Okay, audience, back here, go ahead. Yes, please identify yourself too, thank you. Good morning, University of Minnesota. I am Caprice Jackson, member of the Marcy Holmes community. I completed undergraduate and graduate work at Ball State University, Muncie, Indiana. Although community education is effective, mentally ill and or Alzheimer's patients are highly likely to give an altered outcome due to their mental capacities or mental incapacities. Instead of Alzheimer's patients and the mentally ill who are considered outpatients, let's use, house, let's use hospitalized Alzheimer's or mentally challenged persons whose environments are controlled and monitored. When whatever adverse testing outcomes surface, they can be introduced to the subject, treated, and addressed in an appropriate environment. I find the use of outpatient Alzheimer's subjects and the mentally ill challenge to be questionable in contribution to medical research. Thank you. Your response, please. Thank you. Anyone on the panel? Sue, do you want well, to start? I'd like to jump in. Okay. Um, so first of all, I think it's important to remember that you can't just say all people with mental illnesses because there is this huge continuum. And even in terms of hospitalization, people are not hospitalized for very long. Um, you know, it's an average of eight days. So it'd be pretty difficult to conduct research. And frankly, 
from my discussions with people with serious mental illnesses, they really don't want to be in the hospital that much longer. They really want to be back into the community, in their homes, um, and we know that outpatient treatment can be extremely um, effective for people. Um, do we need additional, you know, intensive community supports available, supportive housing and things like that? Absolutely, but I, I honestly just don't think it would work um, for people with mental illnesses. Anyone else? I, I agree with that. I also think that it's important to consider that some of the treatments are very long-term treatments in these situations. So, you know, the, 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 a, a, a drug, for instance, even a new drug that would try to slow the pro progression of Alzheimer's could be years in the making. And therefore, to provide the inpatient uh, setting isn't really appropriate to think about what kind of supports we need in the community to offer uh, sufficient protections and support is a, is a different issue when the family can't provide it. So I, I do think we want the least restrictive alternative for the patient. Now, if you're going to inject something, you know, uh, acutely and see if that had an effect over 24 hours, there are hospitalizations that are truly clinical research in that setting. Any other members of the panel? Okay, any other questions in the audience here? We have one right down here. We, now we have, a, okay, right over here we'll go, and can you get a microphone over there? Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Please identify yourself and hold the microphone close to your mouth so we can hear you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Connie Bernardi, state representative, representing communities in the northern suburbs of uh, Minneapolis and St. Paul. I am asking, um, I'd like to direct this question initially to Dr. Elliott, and I appreciate um, your courage and leadership in helping protect people of Minnesota and um, patients as well. My question is, being a legislator, what role can we play in this conversation and oversight to really make a difference? And um, I'd open it up after you to the other panelists. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a great question. Well, uh, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to others to, to address what role you can play in the larger conversation. Um, I think we have a serious problem here at the University of Minnesota that the legislature could do something about. Uh, namely, could hold hearings on the scandals here. I mean, uh, the remarkable thing is that uh, before the Markinson scandal, we had a series of uh, extraordinary scandals in the Department of Psychiatry that wound up with our uh, chair of child psychiatry, the director of child psychiatry, going to federal prison for fraud, and two, including him, being disqualified by the FDA. And since those two reports have come out, the scandals haven't stopped. We had a, uh, a member of the Department of, uh, of Psychiatry uh, retire without sanctions this summer after forging federal research documents. I mean, to me, the, the issue here at the University of Minnesota is that there's no one to hold the administration of the university accountable. We have a board of regents that essentially acts as cheerleaders for the president, and we have uh, you know, a legislature that appoints those kinds of regents year after year. I mean, there needs to be some kind of oversight of the university when we have scandals like this. Otherwise, you know, we're just doomed to one after the other. And, and, you know, for those of you who are not from Minnesota, the medical research scandals are not the ones that are in the news right now. I mean, it's the athletic department and the sexual harassment scandals that are in the news. And yet, we seem to be unable to get any kind of oversight or action on that either. I'll, I'll take a different um, view, not from Minnesota and knowing relatively little about it. I think one of the things that... Um, and I, I'm not a lawyer, so I don't have a perfect answer for this, but I think the institutions are, are generally not in a, in a situation where they're protected from liability in the event that they uh, do come forward with concerns about one of their investigators or professors. Um, and they're the, even in the setting of research misconduct, for instance, which has federal regulations around it, um, the 42 CFR 93, 
it can take years to adjudicate a research misconduct finding um, and then have it go forward to the federal regulation. And in that time, the universities really can't do much because there isn't a finding that has been made. So you're exposed on the one hand with liability concerns, even if you know that you've got a potential problem um, and you you have legitimate concerns. Now the, the issue in terms of professional practice and the latitude that an IRB has to say, you know, we, we don't want this person doing uh, clinical research anymore is different than the sort of saying to uh, an applicant organization, you know, this would, I'd be concerned about recruiting so and so. So I just think that's one thing that, that we should get, we should figure out what the safe harbor is there. Sure, sure. Um, I'd just like to add that. You always have to think about what is it that the legislature can do. Are there some, you know, laws that can be passed that require, you know, um, greater transparency or added protections? Um, and then it's always a balancing act. Um, as Carl knows, there was a bill that was passed in Minnesota that um, made it so that people who are under a stay of commitment can't consent to participate in clinical drug trials except under certain circumstances. So if other treatments aren't working, um, if the trial could offer benefits to the individual, um, the psychiatrist who's running the trial can't be the treating psychiatrist, and it does go before a judge to make sure that the person isn't being coerced. Um, but it also looks at would any reasonable person opt into the research study. And I think, as I mentioned earlier, we want to not preclude people who have the most serious mental illnesses from participating in something that could actually help them. Um, but this does add um, additional protections. Any, Jeff, go ahead. So I think another idea to consider uh, here, which is a, a fairly ambitious sort of notion, but part of the concern that I'm hearing here within the Minnesota context is the need for independence to the extent that uh, there has been some loss of uh, trust in the institution's ability to deal with things on its own and oftentimes things begin to, to look self-serving uh, uh, despite people's best efforts. So, you know, one thing to think about is what New York did many years ago, which is an independent task force for life and the law that pulled together scholars uh, and public members from around the uh, state community to speak on specific issues uh, that I think to a certain extent or large extent were uh, dictated by the legislature, which supported that enterprise to say, you know, we need a standard in the state of Minnesota for how research participants are uh, with impaired uh, consent capacity are recruited into research. So it wouldn't be a University of Minnesota thing, it would be a system-wide thing that would be uh, helpful obviously to the state community, but it would be very helpful to the national community for a, a state like uh, Minnesota to potentially recreate that sort of enterprise. Mm -hmm. Any other comments from the panel? Okay, question over here. Go ahead, please. Hi, uh, Laley Fadihi, University of Minnesota. My question is at the intersection of Dr. Kim and Ms. Abderholden's comments. Uh, Dr. Kim, you presented uh, quite a bit of interesting uh, studies indicating what sort of general societies perspective is on what's acceptable for consent in situations of diminished capacity, but given you know, the point that Ms. Abderholden points out that a lot of people with mental illness do have periods of recovery where they regain any diminished capacity, are there studies where people who have had diminished capacity and recovered from it are asked what they regard as acceptable and what the conditions for acceptability are from their viewpoint with respect to uh, getting informed consent during periods where they're unwell. Um, I mean, it seems like it'd be a valuable input if we're trying to make a deliberative discussion of what's appropriate. Um, okay, well, there are, I would refer you to some of the studies that uh, Dr. Ro Laura Roberts, she's now at Stanford, has done interviewing people with chronic psychotic illnesses about their attitudes about being in research and so forth. And they're actually quite similar to the kind of results that I found. Um, you know, if you look at in the aggregate, people's views about research and participation and so forth, 
you know, people are very positive. I mean, I think the thing that makes some of these very important issues that Carl raised in this discussion is the fact that no one is disputing, including patient group, society, you know, we got to do research, and it's important. So I don't think that's under dispute. Um, the question is, you know, specific cases and how to handle them, and are there systemic issues that can help uh, prevent future abuse and how better to re respond to it. I think if we're talking at kind of medium level breaststrokes about what are the values involved and how, what, what are the values reflected by various groups, I, I think it would be very difficult to find strong objections to all the things that uh, I mentioned. I don't know if that answers your question. I, I could say one word about the fluctuating capacity issue is that the Katie study I mentioned, that was a very instructive study because they took people from all sorts of settings, out, stable outpatients, people who were in state hospitals, and in total, I think they had about 1,500 people that they followed for quite a few months. And when you look at the data in terms of how they performed on the capacity evaluations, only about 4% of the people over time, uh, toward at, at some point in the study, fell below what they felt was a threshold for capacity. However, about 20% people performed worse on these evaluations. On the other hand, about 20% did better. So, you know, those are probably, some of it is just random noise and just measurement too. So, you know, I don't know if that helps and you're thinking about that. So I, those are the two parts of the question. Thank you. Anyone else want to address that? Okay. Another question over here, right up here. Your name, please. Thank you. I'm Monica Myers from the University of Minnesota. I cringe to ask this question, but um, we heard a lot of good suggestions about how to improve informed consent. I'm thinking about my colleagues, my fellow research coordinators who go in and obtain research, um, informed consent every day. They spend a lot of time going through and doing a lot of the teach back. I'm wondering where the money comes from to use um, to, to improve the, the um, process, I guess, to use, I'm, I'm blinking on my words now that I'm standing up, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, if we want to improve the, the informed consent process, I know that a lot of our research studies, we don't get paid for the time that we spend screening or um, meeting with people who don't consent. And if we want to spend more time meeting with each individual, making sure that they really truly do um, understand the whole study, I think my, my fellow um, research coordinators do a great job now. But if we want to continue to improve the process, where does the money come from for that? So maybe just quickly to say, to summarize, it takes money to do good oversight. It takes even more money to do even better oversight. Where is it going to come from? Go ahead. Yeah. Um, Got it. I'm sort of, I'm going to sound like I'm not answering your question, but the, putting aside the money question for one second, I don't think that it's the informed, I'm not as pessimistic that, as Dr. Beer was about the informed consent situation because we've done in-depth interviews with people who enter the sham surgery trials for Parkinson's disease. That's one of the controversial studies that you mentioned. And, you know, for studies like that, we found that people sat down with these patients for an hour, investigators, and then the surgeon would sit them for an hour. Some people said they spent total of three hours talking about the study with various staff, including the investigators. And that's really reflected in their understanding of the research. In fact, they had very sophisticated understanding about why, when we asked them, so why do we have to use, uh, why is there a control group? And what was interesting is that instead of saying, you know, it's FDA requires it, it's more rigorous, they would say, well, they would explain to you why placebo effect was a particular problem in Parkinson's disease and why it was so necessary to do sham surgery. So I, I really believe that it's not a complicated issue. It's sitting down with people and talking one-to-one -one and being able to explain it. And it takes money. It's true. And I think that given how much money goes into these trials, it's just a matter of priority. So my answer to the money question is that if we really cared about it enough, we would do it. Jeff? So you'll remember that my first um, bullet is the one-to-one -one interaction, which is the only thing that's really been shown to change to Scott's point. 
to change the level of understanding. But that is, a, a, you know, sort of the tip of the iceberg in terms of the numbers of consents that we do. Um, I think that there's a real role for the CTSAs uh, and for government funding to change uh, and to invest in uh, education and new forms of consent materials. There is no reason why each of us, you know, at Harvard and the University of Minnesota, have to create a video to under, you know, to explain what what an MRI is, or to find neutral, plain language to explain the, you know, side effects of a drug, etc. We should do that nationally. We should have a, an approach that you can go download it, you can point to it, it's been vetted, et cetera, where, whatever those things are. And I mean, I have 100 ideas like that, so just get me going at lunch. Um, uh, but, but you do need somebody and some entity that doesn't have a day job to change the way we do things. And that's not gonna happen currently with all of us sweating to get the day job done. And I fully appreciate the money question. Having run research for 11 years, I get that. Um, and which is why I think we need new sources of revenue for that in order to make it happen. And then flipping some of the uh, expense that we currently spend in low risk trials and other ventures to invest in higher risk uh, and more complicated um, uh, experiments where I think it's critical. Jeff, I think you and then Richard. Well, I agree with both those uh, comments and so just add uh, a couple small elements. Well, perhaps not so small. I mean, this is a huge issue with uh, clinical care uh, as well. Our focus here is research, but informed consent for uh, clinical care uh, is equally uh, as challenging. And so I think one of the things that uh, to think about, and this really picks up on uh, Barbara's uh, presentation, which is more creative ways to use the time that you have. And so uh, we're working on uh, with our center for a genome sequencing uh, approach that will be able to send folks information the day before you anticipate recruiting them, saying someone is going to talk to you about this issue tomorrow. Here's some background information if you have the opportunity. And people have iPads, people have smartphones, you know, not everybody, and not everybody's going to do it, but better use of the time within the clinical environment uh, uh, is um, got to be part of the uh, agenda. Richard? I would say, too, I think even the premise of the question is just highlights the, 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 the way in which the system is broken here. That is an issue because PIs are asked to shoulder the entire cost of each individual clinical trial that they run. Uh, universities typically do not provide the kind of infrastructural support that would allow the coordinator who needs to slow things down and spend more time with an individual research participant the discretion to be able to do that. So again, I'd go back to this analogy with the airline industry that I think we took away from our project. That grounds crewman doesn't phone up to the pilot and say, we need to delay the flight by a half hour, and the pilot doesn't call down and say, well, that's going to cost me $10,000 out of my salary or whatever. Okay, because it's not the pilot that is accountable for the integrity of that whole process. It's the airline itself. Similarly here, it shouldn't be that the PI has to shoulder all the financial and uh, oversight responsibilities for that particular trial. Some investment from the university seems very appropriate. Okay. Any other comments from this group on that cost issue? I think we all agree that it's a really critical piece moving forward. I would suspect you'd all agree that this oversight is only going to get more complicated, not less complicated, because of the needs for the various expertises, et cetera. And uh, this has got to be front and center in terms of the point. And, uh, go so ahead. I just want to. I, I think that Hank bringing our hands about where the money's coming from is a false dilemma. Okay. So, one of the more, most controversial areas in for consent for cancer clinical trials. We know that these academic cancer medical centers, you know, I just read that MD Anderson had, had a profit of, uh, they don't call it profit because it's nonprofit, but. Uh, <laughs> On a, you know, on a operational revenue of $2.2 billion, $560 million of net revenue, net profit. So I think the idea 
that it costs so much money to do and add, you know, to inform consent? You know, it's a priority question. Well, I'm sure a lot of other hospitals would like to be in that situation right now. So, go ahead, John. My name is John Wagner. I'm at the University of Minnesota in bone marrow transplant. And I wanted to respond to something that you said, uh, uh, Barbara, um, and that is in terms of, you know, how do we improve the consent process? And as you know, you know, um, you're a patient of mine, and I tell you, your child just relapsed with leukemia. You probably hear very little after that fact, at least for a while. So it's the context by which you're getting consent that also is variable. And that's just one example, and there's many others. So how you figure that out in a different context is going to be quite challenging. But actually, what I wanted to go back was to something you said, Jeff, in the very beginning. You talked about this MRSA study. <laughs> And that you have, you know, one side with vancomycin has 8% mortality and the other side is 23 or 28% mortality. You know, the difficulty in all that is, is that, you know, yeah, at the very end of the study, it's, it's much more obvious. During the process of the study, you know, not every patient is exactly the same, so MRSA isn't MRSA in everybody in the same way. And so, you know, there's other toxicities that could occur, and certainly you rely on your DSMB, as you've mentioned, so it's not just the IRB and not just the investigator himself. But what happens then if, you know, if then, you know, uh, going back now to Dr. Elliott's you know, point of view, that patients then come back and say, or, or, or one of the uh, research nurses said, I'm not sure they're understanding the consent or, or, or something like that. You know, how do we handle that? Because, I mean, it's important. We, we want to make sure that people understand the consent, but when the patients are sick, that might not always be the same. And, and then how do, we, how do we ensure that we do the best we can? Jeff? Well, I think folks are beginning to think about other ways to adequately, uh, um, first of all, assess people's understanding. We talked a little bit about teach back and some of those sorts of mechanisms, and I think that plays into it. It makes it more challenging for folks to then come back later and say, well, had you actually told me this, uh, and if I had understood that, I never would have participated in your study. When, if you then have documentation, that you've gone through that process. You made a good faith effort to help people understand. Some folks are actually uh, suggesting that we ought to uh, do audiovisual recordings of every consent process, given the cheap nature of uh, uh, hard drives these days, and have that as a, a better, richer documentation than simply a signature on the form. Because no doubt, uh, there's no question that a simple signature on the form provides no reassurance about what people actually understood with that study. So, I mean, that, I guess I'm interpreting your question perhaps in a little defensive fashion about how do we protect ourselves against people who have, who second guess their choices, but maybe, uh, could you use the microphone there? Sorry, just, there you go, sorry. But, but, but just to take that a step further, so what happens is that, you know, uh, as part of that vancomycin study, uh, there was a stopping rule. And the stopping rule said that if three patients, you know, had some adverse event, or five, or whatever that is, that would stop the study. But only four occurred, you know, and not the fifth. Do you inform patients as you go through the study that, you know, that you're getting close to the stopping rule? You know, I mean, if I'm the investigator and I know it, you know, but yet, yet, you know, statistically, we decided up front before the study began that you know, it took five in this particular case to stop the study. Well, great question, and I think obviously you, you can't make decisions along the way that ultimately <coughs> undermine the ability of the study to come to a scientific conclusion, and so premature disclosure of. Uh, Randomization status, for example, would be a serious problem <coughs> with undermining the integrity of the study itself. Right. But uh, understanding that once you do learn something that's been substantiated, uh, the regulations require, and I think common practice, to say you do need to reconsent folks to make sure they want to continue given new knowledge about the nature of the uh, risks uh, uh, involved. But do we tell so, the, but do we tell the, uh, the, pa <coughs> the next patient to being enrolled that we're getting close to the stopping study, stopping yes. rule? So, because for, 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 just it's to Barbara, save you, for, Jeff. <laughs> um, so that's exactly why we have DMCs, you know, to, because the investigators shouldn't be making those decisions, shouldn't be making the decisions in real time. And, and therefore, you need a committee that's going to be constituted to look at it with the blinded, with the blind, uh, unblinded, so that they can adjudicate those kinds of issues. Is it timely? Not always. Is it perfect? Not always, but I think that's part of our responsibility and consent to say, look, there, there is a perfect possibility that one arm will be much 
better than another. And we won't know that until at the end of the study. And I'll make two other points. One is just to annotate yours. I think we do a terrible job in thinking about, for instance, how we consent in adaptive trial design. Because in those designs, you're, you're you know, changing the trial and the entry depending on the outcome to your point. But we don't say to somebody who's going to be the first one in, Look, if you could just hang on for six months, we'll know a lot better. And, you know, you'll have a better chance of getting in the arm that really works well. And we don't do that. We don't even have a national conversation about whether we should be doing it. It's one of the things we're thinking about. Um, and the second thing, I forgot. <laughs> we have a question I'll up. I'll remember it later. And I'll we have a question up here, which is you're very hard to see. You're in the dark spot. But so please. And then we have one down here. Go ahead. Hi, Susan Zishi from the University of Minnesota, EPI, and uh, I just wondered if you could remind us uh, the percentages of dollars uh, for research that are from uh, government sources or versus industry versus uh, just a single uh, investigator uh, driven. Uh, and and uh, I, I asked the question because I, I also wondering if some of the issues that we have with the oversight uh, is related to funding sources and the fact that the, some groups or some funding agencies have uh, oversight data safety and monitoring boards, but a local investigator, single investigator may not. So could you um, well, does it, does answer that know it for respond the to that? Minnesota? Because I know it for others. I, I can't speak for the university. I would I suggest that the single individual investigator still needs support from somewhere, typically. So you're ultimately, it's wherever the dollars come from. I don't know what the University of Minnesota, and I don't think we're prepared today to say that, unless somebody on the stage here has any idea just generally what the overall national research budget looks like broken out by source. And the, the national research budget is $65 billion from the uh, government all in. Yeah. Parenthetically, that's NIH, DOD, DOE, et cetera, so CDC, you know, that's a huge uh, uh, investment. Um, at our institution, it's about 65-ish, this is at the Brigham Women's Hospital, 65-ish from government, of which uh, not all of that is NIH, but the vast majority is NIH. Um, and then there's foundation support and uh, industry. Industry is about 17%. This is two years ago when I stepped down. Um, but if you look at the, uh, the support for clinical research, it's higher from industry. But realize that, you know, the government doesn't bring drugs to market. They do discovery research. They may do early phase, but they're not bringing drugs to market largely nor are foundations, with one major exception, maybe more later, but the CF Foundation did was instrumental in bringing a drug to market, but that's not our remit. Our remit is, is different, um, and we, so it's not un, unreasonable that the industry dollars contributing to clinical trials is greater than you'd see in government or other sources. If I could just make one observation on this, I think that's a critical piece is the fact that one of the things is the mix of funding is changing in a way also that I think challenges, and I would suggest maybe the money is a bigger issue about this. Uh, we're seeing, you know, as federal dollars are becoming shorter in supply, just ask our young researchers about that, philanthropic sources have actually picked up some of that. But we now have major philanthropic funding sources that pay less than 10 percent indirect, a whole new set of recent announcements, zero indirect. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, part of the problem is we're going to have to figure out how to put that into our system of support for these studies, which are not a line item in the study itself, and that's a challenge. That's going to be a challenge. Can I just add, I'm pretty sure um, that the NIMH actually does not fund any clinical trials related to um, uh, pharmaceutical clinical trials on mental health. That's my understanding. Hmm? What do you mean on know how? Yeah. They, they have CRADAs. So. I thought they, I thought they stopped them all. Oh, maybe. Okay, why don't we have a question right here in front and then start wrapping up. Yeah. I, I, I just have some comments. I Your name, of, please. But my name is Bill Gleason. I'm a retired faculty member from the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology. I will say I am a PhD. I am not a doctor. Um, 
That's I not true. You're a PhD. Go ahead. What? <laughs> what? That's what? not true. You're a PhD. Go ahead. <laughs> well, you know the old, you know, we can go round and round about that. <laughs> what if I had a D fill? Anyway, uh, I've been writing a blog for a long time, and I've probably written about 100 pieces on Markinson case. And I'm pretty much in agreement with uh, Carl Elliott, so we'll leave Marcus and go. But I wanted to say just one thing. I want to thank the state representative, Co Connie Bernardi, for attending this meeting, which I think has been just tremendous. I mean, I've been really impressed by what people have to say here. And I wanted to thank Connie Bernardi and the state government. It isn't like they just fell asleep. There were a huge number of faculty members and people from all over the world who wanted an outside investigation of what was going on at the U. And the state auditor, in fact, did this. And I think that kind of outside things happening forced the university to, pro to look at this a lot more closely. So I just wanted to say thank you to the, the state representative who's here. And I want to agree with Carl that looking a little harder at the people who go on to the Board of Regents would probably be a good idea. And we have seen some Board of Regents recently, Regent Shu, who actually said something about an issue and mentioned conflict of interest. Because some of the things that go on at the university, there's a conflict of interest under the table and we have to start recognizing it. Thanks very much and this has just been really great. Thank you. I actually have a question for you, Richard, um, because you, you hit home on this issue today and I think it is a, a, a relatively important concept as we begin to close this session. Uh, some of you in this room know that I have had the unfortunate good fortune to have worked up some of the largest foodborne outbreaks in this country's history and been in charge of them. Um, and have seen what's happened, and I think you use the food area as an example. Uh, in the 1990s, it was a Dwala juice that brought us the very serious E. coli outbreak that a number of children died from that today actually have the safest product on the market. Uh, it was McDonald's hamburgers that brought us a very serious E. coli outbreak that killed a number of kids, and I would argue today because of their technology have the safest hamburgers on the market relative to E. coli. Uh, <laughs> it was Schwann's ice cream that brought us 500,000 cases of salmonella infection back in the 1990s. It's still the largest foodborne outbreak in the country's history that today have so many redundant systems in place that they have probably the safest ice cream, I can say, from all aspects of bacterial contamination. In every one of these instances, there was the event. Then there was the initial recognition that resulted in some cases of, I wouldn't call it denial, but it couldn't be us to the point of where they got to today where there's a culture of safety is so incredible. But they still live in the history of what happened because everybody keeps bringing up what happened. And they forget the fact that there actually was a sea change that occurred and they now lead the country. In every one of those three instances I gave you, those are the three highest safety components I can imagine in food safety. How do you, your studies tell us at the university, which you know I am not directly involved with this other than a very concerned professor at the University of Minnesota, to see if we have a, a, a culture of competency, a culture of concern, a culture of accountability, we just don't keep going back and reliving the past. Can you, can you give us that sense from your own research? Well, I appreciate the opportunity. So we heard a couple things, and, and that was the importance of trust once lost uh, not being easily repaired. And when we had folks that were from the nuclear power industry in particular, uh, they talked about Three Mile Island, and they said that the industry will never, ever, ever recover from that. Uh, again, I think that that's an, an accurate and apt statement here. A, a substantial research misconduct or research uh, integrity breach in biomedical research is not going to go away. We will never forget Tuskegee, right? And I think that, that that's one of those constant reminders about the importance of the long-term investment in this compliance space. Not worrying about whether a particular research study has to be suspended, whether or not there's going to be some delays in writing for that next grant and what have you, but thinking about that longer-term timeline, avoiding something that will truly be catastrophic and from which the, the entire sector, if you will, won't recover. The other thing that they told us was the importance of not trying to respond to these incidents in isolation. So it should not be McDonald's alone that is the responder to that kind of crisis. And what you don't see uh, when McDonald's has its crisis is a whole series of Burger King ads, right, <laughs> saying, look at our hamburgers. Not only are they tastier, they're a hell of a lot safer, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> never in a million years see something like that. Because at the level of the sector of the economy, they recognize that safety is a matter of concern for everyone. The airlines don't market against each other based upon their safety record. And there's a reason for that, right? Because they know that they're all in it together. And I think that that's something that perhaps can be a lesson that could be applied here as well. If there's going to be that kind of sea change culturally, it can't be driven by one organization. It really has to be done by a coalition of uh, interested uh, stakeholders. Okay, we are going to unfortunately have to move on because we have a tight schedule to get to lunch and the next outstanding presentation. But I want to have all of you offer their appreciation to the panel here for a wonderful morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'll turn it back to Susan. Thank you all for a fantastic panel.